So ladies and gentlemen, uh, some of you know Rosie very well. Some of you are going to meet her today. But I have a few rules anytime I'm talking or teaching or lecturing. Saving questions for the end isn't good for our brains. Sometimes you need your question answered to understand what's coming next. So here's the deal. I'm going to give you the best possible presentation I can, and you guys are going to chime in when I screw stuff up with this stuff. You're going to ask the questions, you're going to let me know what you're thinking about, and if I need to kind of step back and fill in some information, you're going to let me know and we'll cover it all that way, right? Okay. Go Lions. <laughs> all right, so who the heck is Rosie the Riveter? Has anyone never come across that name, Rosie the Riveter? Is that brand new to anyone here? Very good. Rosie the Riveter is one of the archetype names that most Americans know. She ranks somewhere below Ronald McDonald <laughs> and somewhere above Uncle Sam in name recognition according to the Pew Research Institute. About 65% of Americans over the age of 18, if you say Rosie the Riveter, they know something about her. Whether that something is accurate, nearer, but they know something about her, they have heard the name before. That is fairly remarkable when President Taft doesn't make the list. So to say that Rosie the Riveter is in the top 100, top 150 recognizable names in the American zeitgeist is really an achievement. But Rosie the Riveter is not one woman named Rosie. In fact, sometimes I have students go, well, what was Rosie's last name? And it's like, well, it depends what one we're talking about. <laughs> because Rosie the Riveter, my friend, the three questions we're going to answer today we are going to show that Rosie the Riveter was not one particular woman, but instead was the archetype that came to represent 680,000 American women who entered World War II's war effort on the home front, taking jobs that were traditionally held by men. Now that is a big old sentence, right? Let's break that down. Jobs traditionally held by men. Pre-World War II, Conductors on the Detroit streetcar lines. Milkmen were milkmen. The people delivering the milk were all men. Most people in management jobs across all of industry were men, and the average factory worker had a 99.3% chance of being male in 1939. These were jobs traditionally held by men. But as World War II leads to conscription and the draft, we see men leaving for the war front. Those jobs need to be filled, so who rises up to take them? The women. These posters are from very early on in World War II, and let's lay out those dates in a timeline to give us all an idea. 1939, what happens? The Nazi party marches over Poland's territory line. This enacts a whole bunch of treaties, which then, <laughs> hey, dog, which then put us into a position where America is, do we get into the war, do we stay out of the war? Tell me what else is going on in 1939. You were born? <laughs> I would say that's a red letter event in 1939. Uh, culturally though, anytime we talk about historical moments, they don't happen in a vacuum, right? Other things are happening at the same time. So what are we sort of dealing with in 39? The Great Depression. So, when Germany marches over that line and we go to war, America's not in the war, it's a European war. We have a political party that forms here in America called the Isolationist Party. Very famous members, a lot of people you might know, Henry Ford, Charles Lindbergh, Bernard Stroh Jr., all members of the Isolationist Party. <laughs> to simplify this down, our oceans will protect us, that is Europe's war, we don't need to be part of it. For the jobs that that starts generating, the jobs in industry, the jobs in factories, the jobs in munitions, who takes those jobs? Men. Men who had been unemployed because of the Great Depression. So from 39, really through late 42, we don't need the women yet. We are backfilling those jobs with men who have been out of work due to the Great Depression. But in 42, what well, late 41, what happens? Pearl Harbor is bombed December 7th. When Pearl Harbor is bombed, that whole isolationist argument of our oceans will protect us sort of crumbles to dust, right? That's no longer a valid argument. So we see um, some people like Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford recant their membership in the isolationist party. We see others hold on. 
But as we transition to conscription, first round of the draft 42, now we're taking the men out of the factory. So when we talk about Rosie the Riveter years, it is not 1939 under Lynn Lease and President Roosevelt's great deal with Winston Churchill. It's not really until 42 in large scale because we have to get that first draft to take the men out of the factories. And with that first draft comes posters like these. Do the job he left behind. Good work, sister. We never figured you could do a man-sized job. The more women at work, the sooner we win. There were advertisements on the radio. If you can work an iron, you can work a steam press. If you know how to vacuum, you can be an industrial cleaner. Today. In our 2023 world, when we look at this, we never figured you could do a man-sized job. We're all kind of going, mm hmm <laughs> <laughs> But this was very indicative of the time. These are all from 1942, and these are all indicating to the public, ladies, you can do it. We believe in you. You can do it. You don't need any special skills. Come on in. We'll teach you how to do it. You can iron. You can steam press. This brings in the first round of the draft. And what no one's really ready for is just how darn good these women become at their jobs. Originally known as WOWs, Women Ordinance Workers. Really rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> Woman Ordinance Worker. Uh, you would come in to a series of aptitude tests. Just like a serviceman or woman would volunteer for service or be drafted for service and then be assigned a branch of the military and a function within that branch, women war workers were given an aptitude test. Simple mathematics, space relation, and analytic logic. Based on where you fell on your abilities in that test determine what job training you got and eventually what position you ended up in. Ladies, if you could type over 60 words a minute, you weren't going to the factory. They needed you in war communication offices, and they needed you in factory offices. You would have got a job as a secretary or senior secretary. If you spoke more than one language fluently, specifically being able to read and write in that language, and if it was Russian or Polish in particular, we've got a job for you, no need to go into the factories. They refer to this often in academic textbooks as sort of the cream of the crop off the top. Women with a specific skill already ingrained were pulled at this point and taken to those specialty jobs. This took between 6 and 8% of the female workers, so we're not talking about a major group, but in particular, dual language and typing skills. If you didn't get uh, kind of yanked with that categorization, you would then start looking at those spatial relations, general mathematics, your abilities. Once that your abilities were sort of put into a category, you could fall into one of five categories. If you were like me with no arguable skills, you very quickly became a painter, a cleaner, or a parts preparer. A job that you could be taught with about three hours of training. That was valuable. That was necessary. If you had really good spatial relations, you understood size and measure, sir, get over here, you're just fine, you're not walking in front of anything, um, you would have been put into a position where you would have learned either draftsman skills or production manufacturing skills. But if you were strong, and ladies, I'm going to blow you away, if you could lift the overwhelming weight of 36 pounds, you could qualify for welding or riveting school. Welding and riveting were two very big jobs. They took about 30% of the female workers to those two specific jobs in the state of Michigan. Uh, and our numbers get a little skewed. We get locked in with Ohio and Indiana in a lot of these math, uh, a lot of the government numbers. So we get to include our, our friends to the south in these numbers. But about 60% ending up in just two jobs. And these jobs were needed. So check out this poster, she's a wow, or my girl's a wow. Do you see that headgear lined up? Those are all the different jobs, large scale, painting with a broad brush, available for women during World War II. You could be a whack, you could be a way, you could be an army nurse, you could be a navy nurse, you could go to the Red Cross, or you could be a wow. Oh, we've got some wonderful tribute rosies with us today, beautifully demonstrating the polka dot bandana. 
And behind you, you have a traditional Rosie the Riveter. That's the J. Howard Westing, uh, Westinghouse. We can do it, Rosie, all wearing polka dots. But you see on this war poster, 1943, what she's wearing and what the cap shows? That's this. And Chris and his wonderful museum have actually reproduced these. This is a wow bandana. It's bombs, not polka dots. This is what you would have worn during World War II, not the polka dots. But this will factor in a little bit more as we go. But the idea that right along with serving in the military, right along with serving in the Red Cross, being a woman of war ordinance worker was part of the war effort. Being included in this group, that's a big deal. And do you see how the posters have changed in just 18 months? From we didn't think you girls could do a man-sized job to a soldier being proud that his girl was working on the home front. Now again, in our 2023 eyes, we're looking at that going, she don't need him. <laughs> <laughs> she's cute, she's got a good job, she'll be just fine. But this is a real change in the rhetoric surrounding women workers. And then everything changes in June of 1942 when Reed Evans and John Jacob Lowe produce and publish Rosie the Riveter. Ladies and gentlemen, Rosie the Riveter, the term comes from a song. Before this song was published, these women were called WOWs, Women War Ordinance Workers. This song comes out, and when it comes out, it changes everything. I'd like to play it for you now. Ooh, volume. Oh. I'm there. I'm on there. Okay, option two. Watch that way. <laughs> Which is cool for history, not tech. Terrible at this. But have it saved in my iTunes and can use the microphone. Is it supposed to come out of these speakers? Uh, it should, but if it doesn't, if you can, if you are a tech person who can save that for me, you are welcome to it. Otherwise, we can get it this way and we're all friends, so we're going to forget about this little tech flow. Mm -hmm. All right. We are all alone, but the rain is shining. She's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory, frozen. Keeps a sharp look out for seven times Sitting up there on the kiss of lunch I'm a little afraid to do more than the man to do Rosie The man to do Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie Charlie, he's a marine Rosie is protecting Charlie Working overtime on the riveting machine When they gave her a production need She was as proud as a girl could be That's something true about red, white, and blue about Rosie The man to do Thank you.
world. Um, I try. So this song comes out. Let's talk about some of those lines. All day long with a rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's working for victory. She's making history. Rosie, Rosie the Riveter. All right, level with me, friends. Have you ever been doing something and a song comes on the radio and you hear it and you think, oh, they wrote this one about me. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our genres, right? But that song that just connects with you, whether it's about a place you used to live or a job you do or a summertime activity, and you hear that song and you think, by golly, they absolutely must have written this one about me. I want you to imagine being a woman doing a job that most of the rhetoric was, golly, look at you, that's impressive, didn't think you could do that. And all of a sudden, you are literally straddling the fuselage of an airplane and ribbing it together. You're skinning a Sherman tank. You are building the ammunition. And this song is on the radio, and you think, whoa, whoa, whoa. that song's about me. I'm working for victory. I've never been so proud as when I earned my production E. And this song, covered by no less than 18 bands between 1942 and 1946, suddenly starts taking on a life of its own, getting some legs. And the women who feel this song represents them start referring to themselves as Rosies. Now as they're referring to themselves as Rosies, I'm a Rosie, I'm that girl in the song, it becomes a huge song for US audiences and a huge song for military sort of good feeling, public relations, motivation. So then you get fellas who are going, my girl back home, she's a Rosie. No longer my girl's a wow. And the name gets legs and takes off. Now, in Canada, they had Wendy the Welder. In Australia, they had Patty the Painter. This is alliteration. Why is Rosie a riveter, and why is the riveter a Rosie? R -R. Just like in poetry and songwriting, we go for those alliterations, those rhymes. This plays in. But we've now got a woman that nationally everyone's referring to, that women are saying, I am one of, that men are proud to have married or are dating, and we don't actually have the woman to represent those women because it's a song. So what do we do? We backfill the job. This is the May 29th, 1943, Saturday Evening Post. Sir, may I put you on the spot for a moment since you told us that you were alive in this era? Other than the Saturday Evening Post, do you remember any magazine being bigger? Maybe Life Magazine would be the only... I'm a car guy. Oh, you're a car guy. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and think of this as Automotive Daily. Um, Saturday Evening Post was huge. At one time, about 15% of all American households had a subscription, and most library services had 15 to 20 copies every single week. It was a very, very popular magazine. And the Saturday Evening Post hires Norman Rockwell and says, we really need a Rosie the Riveter. We need a woman to represent this song, these women, and backfill the job of Rosie. So Rockwell thinks, all right, I can do that. He hires a 19-year-old woman named Mary Doyle. He has her dress up as Rosie the Riveter. She's a telephone operator in Vermont, had never riveted in her life. He dresses her up, and unwilling to reinvent the wheel, Rockwell uses poses from traditional art. This is the prophet Isaiah on the Sistine Chapel, painted about 500 years before Rosie. <laughs> But you see his pose? Rockwell mimics it. Rockwell as an artist believed there were only a certain number of attractive poses, only a certain number of attractive uh, sort of ways of organizing a painting. They'd all been figured out by the masters, copy, paste, repeat. So instead of dressing Mary Doyle as the prophet Isaiah, he dresses her as Rosie the Riveter. Instead of her foot resting on a plinth as the prophets does, her little petticoat uh, loafer is a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf. <laughs> Instead of a toga draped over her laps and tablets under her elbow, she has her rivet gun and her lunchbox, where he seems to be pointing, she's got a ham sandwich. <laughs> and across her chest, those are the badges, the V for having a victory garden, the Red Cross saying she had done that training, and this angular badge low, that's her Army Navy E for Excellence Awards Award. She was as proud as a girl could be when she earned her production E right there in the song. Now, Rosie the Riveter is not Mary Doyle. Mary Doyle is not Rosie the Riveter, but Mary Doyle becomes the visual representation of the 
first Rosie the Riveter image. If you were alive during World War II, this is the Rosie the Riveter you would know. This is Mary Doyle, that is Margaret Rockwell. She was paid $14.75 to pose for the picture. <laughs> now Mary Doyle knew in her lifetime she had been Rockwell's Rosie. If you were alive in World War II, this is the image of Rosie you know, in part because the federal government got this sucker everywhere. Rockwell licensed it to the War Bond Committee. Number one selling war bond in American history bears this image. When the war ends, Rockwell recalls his copyrights. It's got a back right. By the way, this is Mary Doyle in 1999. Mary spent her life knowing she had represented Rosie's. And upon her death, uh, there's a really beautiful obituary that was published in both the New York Times and her home paper. She was living in Florida at the time of her death. Uh, the obituary spoke to the fact that she had wonderful children, beloved grandchildren, was active in her church and seemed to be an all-around great gal. But it closed with a line that I think her family just nailed. It said, our mother's greatest honor was representing the hundreds of thousands of women who brought honor to this nation during World War II. So she had the privilege of spending her life knowing her image was one of the rosy images. This one goes the other way. Now, before the presentation started today, if I would have shown you this image and the Rockwell rosy and said, which is the real rosy, who would have raised their hand on this one? Totally, right? This is the rosy the Riveter we see. Let's level with each other. Why do we see this one? Because this was done by a guy named J. Howard Miller. Are you saying money? Money. That's a smart man back there. Feel free to pass yours forward. Um, you're absolutely right. It's money. J. Howard Miller created this for the Westinghouse Company in Ypsilanti, Michigan. This wasn't, we can do it, we can enter the war effort. This is, we can do it, we can work the 10-hour shift. This hung at Westinghouse. And unless you worked at Westinghouse between summer of 43 and fall of 45, you didn't see this image until the 1970s. But it wasn't copyrighted. It wasn't trademarked. It was staff art done for a company never meant to see the light of day outside of the company. So Rockwell pulls back his copyrights. If I want to put uh, Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter on a t-shirt, a coffee mug, um, a sticker, I'm going to pay a licensing fee to the uh, Crystal Briggs Museum in Arkansas, which today controls that painting. Licensing starts at $10,000. This image, after its use at Westinghouse, went into a flat file folder. And everyone kind of forgot about it. And then when Westinghouse was sold, it was moved, and it entered into the free source catalogs, where in 1971, Betty Fernand bought the rights to this image for 50 bucks. This is why we see this Rosie everywhere. You can buy the rights to this for $50. I own the rights to this. I can make that say, we can taco Tuesday. And nobody can come <laughs> yell at me, I have done nothing wrong. If I do that with a Rockwell Rosie, they're gonna own me, my dog, my house, half my husband, it's gonna be ugly. <laughs> so the reason that we see this one so much more, sir, you nailed it, it's money. This one is available. This one is free to reproduce. And this one gives us the opportunity to make stickers for prizes. <laughs> but the Westinghouse Rosie has this very, very short lifespan. And when that lifespan uh, kind of comes back in its second wave, under Betty Fernand, this is the image we see. Now, J. Howard Miller is a staff artist. As a staff artist, anything he creates belongs to the company he works for. Anyone in this room an artist, a painter, a sculptor? Oh, we're aiming at people. Yeah, Tom's a beautiful artist. Um, mm -hmm. Do you save things? Do you like clip out inspiration and save it? Yeah, and maybe like a cork board or inspiration or things go out the fridge. Artists have this wonderful way of having this mental Rolodex where they'll see something and they'll go, oh, I don't know what I'm going to use that for, but I need to save that because visually it inspires me or visually I know it'll fit in something later. Well, J. Howard Miller, no different, he saves stuff. This is a woman named Naomi Parker. This is an Associated Press photograph. Associated Press, long before Getty Images, they would catalog national and international images that could then be purchased and used by papers. So if you're writing for the Detroit Free Press or you're writing for the London Times and you need a photo of a woman war worker, you would go to the Associated Press and they would license you the use of an image. So this image was snapped in a ship factory, shipbuilding factory, out in California. Her name was Naomi Parker. She later married, I'm sorry, her name was Naomi Farley at that time. She later married and became Naomi Parker. 
But Naomi didn't know this photo was snapped. She had no idea. Look at her. She's just working. She is doing her job. But it runs in a lot of papers, including some local Michigan papers. And J. Howard Miller sees it. He thinks, woo, I like that. She's cute, she's pretty, she's a factory worker, I'm going to save the picture. So he clips it out. So when the bosses come to him and say, hey, we need a poster to convince women to the 10-hour workday, he starts looking around for inspiration, finds this. She had no idea it was her until the 1980s. In the 1980s, she kind of quietly starts raising her hand and saying, I think that's me. I think that's based off me. And everyone said, oh, you're nuts. That's not you. You're crazy. Then in 1997, J. Howard Miller dies. He gives his entire estate, including his collection of artwork, to the Crystal Briggs Museum in Arkansas so that this Rosie can be with the other Rosie, except the Westinghouse says no and keeps the original painting. But in uh, all of the sketches, they find something curious. A newspaper clipping of Naomi Parker Farley attached, pretty much ending any conversation that this image wasn't inspired by her. People Magazine in 2001 tracked her down and gives us this image of Rosie. This, of course, the wild bandana. So we talked about the idea that these used to be are we represent Rosie today with a polka dot bandana. But what was Naomi Parker wearing? A bombardier's bandana. What would most of the women in the factory be wearing? A bombardier bandana. These came in two varieties. They're slightly larger than Western bandana at 20 by 20 originally, and they were slightly thicker, made of an oil cloth to help keep chemicals off your hair. The federal government, being the federal government, had an idea. They said, we can't just do one, we have to do two. We'll do a red with white bombs for winter and white with red bombs for summer. Women, being clever, went, who the hell is going to wear a white bandana into a factory? <laughs> and only bought the red ones. Uh, in fact, they sold about 9 to 10, red to white. So the summer idea never really took off. We stuck with the ones we thought wouldn't stain. But when um, J. Howard Miller is credited with giving us Rosie's polka dots, because he's a staff artist, there's always a boss over him going, faster, more, get more done, make more, do more, be more. So he doesn't have time to paint all these little bombs. He simplifies it to polka dots. And then artists, generations later, continue the polka dot trim so that today when Rosie tributes gather, whether we're breaking a world record or getting together for a lecture and thank you for coming, um, the uniform is polka dots. In fact, if you showed up in this to the Guinness World Record, even though you would be historically accurate, you wouldn't count for the count. Isn't it strange how history can get uh, unintended edits? But the wild bandana, uh, Chris sells them, and they're beautiful reproductions here in support of the museum, was advertised as the bandana to keep her safe in the factories. What were we keeping ourselves safe for by putting our hair up? All right, now you might be a little louder here. Come on, yell out. Step in the machines. Who said that? Absolutely. Can I ask you to pass that to the young lady? Stuck in the machines, sure. I mean, you don't go down into a factory with your hair down like mine, bend over a, a spinning, whirling contraption, and all of a sudden, there it goes. What else? Come on. Who said chemicals? Miss Maggie. Well done. Absolutely chemicals, which was part of the reason for that little thicker fabric. You didn't want to bleach your hair. I mean, a woman's hair, our crowning glory, you got to protect that. So this becomes as much a part of the uniform as the blue coveralls, which, by the way, wore in a uniform. Do you ever wonder why, let me go back for a second, do you ever wonder why Rosie's clothes don't fit? Why her pants are rolled up and cuffed? Why her sleeves are rolled up? They're men's. They're men's. I heard that from a couple of people. Who else said that? Can you pass for me, please? Thank you. Um, absolutely, they're men's. We had rationing during World War II. What did we ration? Yell it out. I got prizes galore. Sugar. Sugar. Very good. Who yelled sugar? Butter. Butter. Absolutely. Yeah. Sugar. Who yelled that? Butter. Butter. Got She said sugar. Sugar. Yeah. That's a prize fuel. Absolutely. Right. Gasoline. Damn Darn near right. Everything. Gasoline. Uh -huh. Darn right. Damn near everything. Damn near everything. <laughs> There's a man after my own heart. So stockings. Heck yes. So stockings. Why do we ration? I know you know. We needed it for the parachutes. Very good. Yeah, we needed those silk stockings. We needed that silk for parachutes. So how did we get around it? 
you drew the seam off the back of your leg with the eyeliner pencil. But yes, exactly, so we're rationing all of this stuff, right? So you get a factory job. You're the first woman in your entire ancestral line to have a job outside the home. This might be the first time you've ever needed a pair of pants. You've lived your life in skirts and dresses. This might be the first time you're gonna wear a shoe without a heel since childhood. And now, if you wanna go buy those items, you gotta have a ration coupon to do it. Not just the money to make the purchase, but the ration coupon. And are you going to spend that precious ration coupon on an outfit to wear to a factory? No. Oh, no. You're saving those for the fancy stuff, the USO dances. You're going to go into the garage or the attic or your brother's trunk, and you're going to get the hand-me-downs. You nailed it. The reason their clothes don't fit, they're wearing men's clothing. They're wearing hand-me-downs. They're wearing what they could find. <laughs> we have women showing up to the Willow Run factory in Ipsy Landing, Michigan, wearing their brother's baseball uniforms, wearing their dad's coveralls from a different factory because it was what was available. So when you see images of Rosie the Riveter and she's got her, you know, rolled and cuffed and ready to go to work, yes, that's rolling up our sleeves and getting down to the job, but it's also just making stuff that wasn't ours fit and function. Make use and mend, as it were. So the rosy bandana, the wow bandana, in many ways became a unifying thing. Because without a factory uniform, and with every woman showing up in a slightly different version of rummage sale, garage sale, attic clothing, being able to have something they could purchase relatively inexpensively, that the government separated and did not require a ration card to purchase, this gave them a way of looking around and going, that guy's in the Army, I'm in the Army too. That guy's in the Navy, let's tease him. This gave the women a way of going, I'm a Rosie, she's a Rosie. I'm a WOW, she's a WOW. And it became a unifying symbol. Now, I said at the beginning of this that there was no woman named Rosie who riveted. And that is not accurate. Because Rosemary was the eighth most popular name in 1920. <laughs> so by 1942, the women who are going into these factories, the eighth most popular name among them, is a variant of Rosie. But the song wasn't written about a specific woman. So just like we backfill with the visual art of who Rosie the Riveter is, we backfill with casting the job. This, my dear friends, is Rose, Will Monroe, and she moves to Michigan from Kentucky. Have you all heard the old joke, um, 1939, it was in the New Yorker magazine, President is talking to Mr. Henry Ford. The president says, Mr. Ford, how many states in the union? And Henry Ford says, 46, sir. Kentucky and Tennessee have moved to Detroit. <laughs> At the time, there were 48. They didn't have Alaska point. So Rose is part of this. She's part of this main drive up north, up to the factories of World War II. And Rose is uh, lovely. I think we can all agree. She's a very attractive young woman. Uh, she has two children. She takes a job making B-24s up at Willow Run. And when she starts working at Willow Run, she is one of about 40,000 employees. And she is brought here the same way many of them arrive. These posters would have hung all over train stations in the South. Simply put, what they say is, we'll pay the train ticket if you come to work for the war effort. If you will leave Appalachia, if you will leave the Smoky Mountains, if you will come up to Detroit and Pittsburgh and Cleveland, and you will work for the war effort, we will guarantee your train fare. So if you're broke as a joke without a penny to your name, get on the train, get to us, and we'll take care of you. And this brings Rose. Now, when she starts at Willow Run, the factory is not yet completed, leading to a kind of a nasty nickname, Will It Run? <laughs> which uh, hung over it for quite a while. Now, someone nailed it earlier. When the factory is first built, we are not yet rationing gasoline, I believe you said it, and tires, I know someone said it. Um, so people don't worry about living in Detroit and taking the job in Ypsilanti. No worries, we can get there. But once the rubber and gasoline start being rationed, it leads to things like Bomber City, housing built to support the factory to get those workers on site because the war effort was being impacted by workers not being able to get to their jobs. Greatest increase in women in Michigan having driver's license, 1942 to 1943, 260% increase. Wow. Enter Walter Pidgeon. Uh, anyone seen any of his own movies, Terra Classic? I mean, 
He's yeah. kind of a, a star of, of the silver screen and the golden era. What'd you say? I saw one last night. It was Minerva. Were you at the Redford? No, I was at home. Oh, <laughs> um, the Redford Theater does a, a Walter Pigeon Marathon every year. It's always really good. Uh, he's kind of a hunk. Let's just call a spade a spade. <laughs> but he needs to be in the war effort. Now, during World War II, we see a lot of baseball players, a lot of professional athletes, a lot of uh, actors, a lot of musicians give up their fame and fortune and join a branch of the military. We also see a real movement towards shaming those who do not. And Walter Pidgeon is caught in a really tough spot. He is blind as a damn bat. He has very bad astigmatism. The military doesn't want him. But he is young, fit, and looks to be able. So he is catching flack from every direction of, why aren't you helping the war effort? You're just sitting in your Hollywood home being all rich and fancy. Boys are dying. And he thinks, all right, I got to find a way to get into the war effort. What do I know? I know the movies. What can I do? I can take on raising money for war bonds through creating short films, sort of a la newsreels, that will play ahead of movies in support of the war effort. So Walter Pidgeon comes to Detroit, and he is looking for Rosie the Riveter. He's basically central casting. He's going to find a woman. He is going to build her into the Rosie that they need and have her start doing these newsreels in support of two things, selling war bonds and getting more women to take factory jobs. Who does he pick? Rose Will Minerva. She's lovely. She's named Rose. She's working in the factory, albeit not as a riveter. And he comes to her and says, I think you're perfect. I think you'll work great. We're going to call you Rosie. She says, I've never been called Rosie in my life. I've always been Rose. He says, welcome to being Rosie. <laughs> uh, she becomes sort of the center of a lot of newsreels. And many people take her as the real Rosie the Riveter. But she got the title about 19 months after the song first hit the air, about seven months after the Rockwell Rosie image, and contemporarily almost at the same time that Naomi Parker's image is making its way at Westinghouse. By 1944, all of these newsreels have culminated in this real thirst for Rosie. People want more of her. And they make a movie called Rosie the Riveter. If any of you are really just bored out of your board, <laughs> like you have got time to kill. Yes, ma'am? I've seen it. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> it's, like, it's not just bad. It's like <laughs> laughable bad. When they're doing the can-can line with the mid-drift outfit and the rivet guns, are you dying laughing? I mean, it's, it's absurd. I didn't movie. get that far. It is absurd. <laughs> um, in fact, a lot of actual Rosies, a lot of women ordinance workers, protested the movie. They said it mocked what they did. It is a full-blown, campy, 1940s musical movie. It is available on YouTube for free. You are going to want to use the fast-forward button often. But um, thank you for backing me up, Don, because it's not just bad. It is like... Good lord, what were they thinking, bad? <laughs> but it builds this story, right? Because even the worst movies get a little highlight reel that gets some buzz. Even the worst movies are up on the big signs outside of the movie palaces. Rosie the Riveter. So it's bringing fame to this work. Think about what a war movie does to encourage uh, sign up in the military. Even a shitty one. Think about what this does. Now you're not just a woman war ordinance worker. You're doing the job of a Harlem Hollywood starlet. You're doing a job so important it was turned into a film. It keeps that credibility snowball rolling downhill. But again, it takes away and detracts from the fact that there were real women who were Rosies. And those women are often misrepresented. Now, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines Rosie the Riveter as any woman who takes a job traditionally held by a man in support of the war effort of World War II on the home front. But both the images of Rosie I've shown you, the song, the movie, the newsreel selected person, what do they all have in common? They're all young. They're all pretty. They're all skinny and they're all white. And that is not an accurate assumption of who the Rosies were. 680,000 of them, 40% of them were African American. 12% of them were Asian American, which at this time includes Native American. 12% were Hispanic. 
25% were over the age of 60. 80% were under the age of 20. Why? Why would we want the young right out of high school or the older, but not that big middle section? Bingo! Very good. We don't want the children. If, um, just like the soldiers, if we take you right out of high school before you have your kids, great. If we take you at 55, 60 when your kids are old enough to take care of themselves, great. But if we take a 30-year-old mother with two young children and put her in a factory, now we have to create another job for someone to take care of those children. So Rosie really was a split of younger women and older women. Now there is about 6% that fall into that gap area. So yes, there were Rosies in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, but the vast majority were the young or the already raised their children. And that middle were often the women who didn't have children. So kids in childcare become a big part of this. What are all these women training to do? This is my old high school. This is Cody High School in Detroit. They're training to be child care expert technicians. <laughs> these women are training to literally take care of the other children, or the other women's children, when those women are in the factories. These women, about 12 of them, will end up assigned to the Fisher Building in downtown Detroit. The Fisher Building had on-site childcare during World War II because so many women were working in the building that in order to keep the women working, they had to have childcare. It went 24 hours a day. And these women were considered rosies for taking on this task in support of the war effort. <laughs> that is a matron. Oh. Who is in a, she looks like she keeps a tight clock, right? <laughs> um, anyone in a sorority and have a house mother? Same idea. When we start seeing women leave the home for work, this horrifies mama and papa. No matter how patriotic this is, no matter how accepted this is, the idea of women leaving the household was foreign ground, was, was untrodden path. And as we uh, start seeing places like Bomber City at Willow Run be built, campuses to house workers, this is, for most people, the first time a woman would leave home before marriage. You went from your parents' house to your spouse in his house. The idea that you as a young woman would set out and have your own nice apartment downtown with your own life and your own friends, not so much at this period. So as these women are being taken up to live in these facilities to be able to better do their work in support of the rationing as well, the federal government has some pushback from the parents. Their solution to that is matrons. A matron assigned to the house, their job is to make sure the Bible was next to your bed and the boys weren't in the bed. <laughs> they made sure you went to work in the morning, they made sure if you got sick you were taken care of, they were your sorority mother. And that job, generally held by the older women of the group, uh, became very, very influential towards the care of these women, but more importantly, towards their parents allowing them to go. Without these matrons, there were parents who would have said, nah, your brother can go off to war, but you can't go up to Italy. So it was not uncommon for a matron to come and sit in the parent's household, explain that the child would be taken care of, explain that they would be there living in the home. And do you know where the matron's bedroom was? Right by the front door. <laughs> do you see all that like, long line of ladies and the two gentlemen standing off to the side? So there's a whole bunch of exemptions to get out of the draft. I should say get out of the draft. To not qualify for the draft. Excuse my phrasing there. Um, those include things like a medical reason. Walter Pidgeon had astigmatism. He visually would have passed the test. Things like diabetes, flat-footedness, um, any sort of muscular uh, ailment would keep you out of the draft. You could also be kept out with what they call the genius exemption. This is what Etzel Ford uh, receives. The idea being that on the home front, they can stop thousands of bullets. On the war front, they can stop one. That the skills they have are so valuable, we need to keep them home to train a new set of workers. That is more than likely what these two gentlemen benefited from. They would be there training this line of women to take on jobs traditionally held by men. This is the Kellogg's factory in Battle Creek, Michigan. Those hoppers used to fill cereal boxes. They're not being used to do that anymore. Anyone got a guess? Ammunition boxes. <laughs> Ammunition boxes, very well done. Ooh. Let me pay up, very well done. It's amazing what equipment can be retrofitted for. <laughs> Here's a woman working on a lathe. The short haircut becomes popular in the 40s. The bob of the 20s 
comes back in the working girl's cut of the 40s. If you couldn't pin it all up, get it short, get it above shoulder length. See the gentleman there uh, on the right hand side, and then the ladies working their way down and on the left. This is the Ford Highland Park factory. During World War II, it helped produce the uh, engines that would go into the B 24 and the B 17. That's uh, the Hell Diver and the RAF military, same plane, different name. These guys are building the engines. This gentleman on the side is a man named Charles F. Thompson. And Charles F. Thompson was a graduate of Wayne State University with a master's in engineering. He wanted to go off and join the Navy. His father had been in the Navy in World War I. And the Ford Motor Company said, no, you cannot leave. You work for us, and we will fight the federal government if they want to take you. This gentleman felt strongly that his place was on the war front, and the federal government sided with his employer, Ford, and said, nope, we're not taking you. You've got to stay home. He threw a fit. He gives a talk. Uh, the Detroit Free Press actually quotes him as saying, I should not be forced to teach women how to do men's work. Oh. 1946, he's given the Army Navy E for Excellence, turns around and hands it, hands it to his deputy, who happened to be a woman. He later says they are the finest people I've ever had the privilege of working with. He was in charge of 76 women at Ford Highland Park. This is one of them. Her name is Bertha. G. Sicily. This is my great great aunt, uh, my grandma's eldest sister. She was a bit of a powerhouse, never married, um, <coughs> would arm wrestle anybody. But her job, uh, she actually was a, a drill press operator. Do you see how there is a jig assembled here? She sat spent all day making the same part hundreds, if not thousands, of times on repeat for weeks. She taught herself how to speak Polish during this time. The woman working on the lathe across from her spoke Polish, she spoke Russian. They spent this time talking, and during the war, she learned enough Polish that at the end of the war, she got a job taking uh, Polish dictation or letters being sent between Poland and America, and would make pretty good money uh, kind of doing that at churches. This image I adore because it shows a different version of that jumpsuit. A lot of these women had sewing skills. It was a very, very common skill for the day, and they were not only uh, able to sew on buttons and do the basics, but they were able to tailor. So when we start getting into year two and year three, and they start putting on dad's overalls again and going, ah, you know, I could just, I could really make this better. We start seeing things like nipped in overalls, short sleeve overalls, overalls that have an undershirt, and we start seeing a lot of expression in that way. Again, the above shoulder bob. <laughs> There's Mr. Henry Ford, and this is riveting together an airplane. Simply put, and I am really simplifying this, a rivet is a tube of metal where you mushroom out both ends, trapping in between those mushroomed ends as many layers of material as you want to rivet together. Sort of a staple, but not a staple. A tube where the ends are mushroomed out. The tiniest rivets can be just a couple of grams. The biggest can weigh several pounds. But in order to drive that rivet, you need a press point. You need the front and the back. So when you see them going down a fuselage like this, for every woman on the outside, there's a partner on the inside. Now, if you're going to strike something on time, and you're all going to do it at the same time so that when you hit, it doesn't go flying because nobody's there with the backer, you need a rhythm. What's the easiest way to get a rhythm? A work song. Music. The Rose of the Riveter song would have been playing as they did this. Anything J.K. Keisner, anything sort of USO Americana, anything with that ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, where they could tie to it and hit these rivets. Now, I told you Rosie the Riveter was not all white women. In fact, every ethnicity was represented with the exception of Japanese Americans. Those women were excluded, as were Japanese American men most spending the war in the internment camps. But for African Americans, the Rosie movement was an interesting one. Because just like servicemen found themselves starting to integrate into battalions that feature black and white soldiers, we see Rosie suddenly working with people they had never worked with before. Have you heard the Mark Twain quote that travel's the greatest way to fight ignorance? Mm -hmm. Meeting people's the greatest way to fight racism. 
when you've been told that somebody or a group is like something or about something or behaves in a certain way for years, but you've never met anyone from that group, and then suddenly you meet someone from that group and you go, shit, she's just like me. Ham sandwich in her lunchbox, hair up under a bandana, doing the same job I'm doing, it starts breaking down some of those barriers. Now, did we fix it all? Heck no. We still haven't fixed it all. But for many, this was one of the first times that multiracial friendships had a place to start flourishing. When you're working that close to each other, it's pretty hard not to have the chit chat. It's pretty hard not to know their mother's name. It's pretty hard to not know what they're eating for lunch. It's pretty hard to not go, hey, you wanna bring sandwiches tomorrow and I'll bring sandwiches Tuesday so we both don't have to make sandwiches tonight. And these friendships are born. Outside of factories, women took on other jobs that qualified them as Rosies. For this next series of slides, I'm going to show you jobs, and you're going to tell me Rosie or not a Rosie. This is Acme Tool and Dye. This used to be in Hamtramck, Michigan. Now it's in Sterling Heights, Michigan. These women were part pickers, so they did not do great on the aptitude test. <laughs> but what they had was reading and writing, basic <laughs> arithmetic, and good hard work ethic. Their job was to get a sheet from a factory, and it might be four cases of nut A, and three cases of washer size C, and these springs, and this bit, and this bob, and they would run around and pull. You can just see it in the upper right hand, all of the bins. They'd pull everything for that order to go off to that factory. Well, these women start working the job, and the men start going, you're not fast enough. You're not strong enough. The boys do this quicker than you. So they go home, get roller skates, and suddenly are faster than the boys. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really the most accurate way I can explain Rosie the Riveter. You can't do that. Hold my polka dot bandana. <laughs> I will find a way. Earning that Army Navy E. Uh, the Army Navy E award. Chris, do you have one in the collection? So you guys have to come back and spend time at this museum. I saw quite a few of you. This is your first experience here. They have such fabulous items. With the Army Navy E Award, highest civilian honor given to a factory, it's for mobilization and production. Detroit becomes known as the arsenal of democracy. About 10% of all of these awarded were awarded in Detroit, Highland Park, Ham, Tramick, and Warren. Why Warren? Tank Con, the tank arsenal is there. Very, very good. Did I hear someone else say that? Ah, did you prize? Who said that? Well done. Chris, you have really smart groups. I'm going to have to bring more stickers. <laughs> so, oh, I apologize. Slide out of order. That's the terrible movie. All, you know, we're all snowed in. Do this tonight. You'll laugh your butt off. <laughs> <laughs> There's that Army Navy Eorn. Oh, God, my slides are way out of order. Okay, we're going to skip ahead. I'm going to come back. I apologize. So, this is what. Uh, where I want you to tell me Rosie or not a Rosie. This is Hudson Motor Car. So the nephew of J.L. Hudson, who owned the department store, started a car company. This is his car company. That is his security department in 1943. <laughs> Rosie or not a Rosie? Rosie. Damn right, because they never could have come close to this job before the men left for the war. In the middle there, that's Lena Horne. Who did the most USO shows in American history? Lena Horne. Lena Horne. Horn. Everyone thinks it's Bob Hope. This is a very good group. Uh, she almost doubled up what Bob Hope did. Would we consider her a Rosie? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I think she counts. I think she counts for another reason, too. She was originally given male security. She said, no, nope. I've read in Life magazine that you have weights and waves. You go get me two of those girls. Mm -hmm. And when the military said, no, you must be protected by the best she had, she said, did you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> These are her security officers. I checked. Neither of them was from Michigan, darn it. But. <laughs> Now here's an interesting one. This is a bar in Detroit called Abex. Built in 1907, corner of Michigan and Gilbert in southwest Detroit. Anyone been? Did I hear someone come? We've been to Gilbert. I know what I'm talking about here. Um, the Abex family, um, mother, Catherine, her husband was predeceased, and her four children, uh, three boys and a daughter. Three boys go off to the war, two in the Navy, one in the Army. Daughter and her stay and run the bar. They keep the bar going, they uh, collect ration coupons for food and make sure the entire neighborhood can eat. They really run the bar in the absence of the boys. And when the boys return home from World War II and say, okay, we're gonna take the bar back, mom. Mom says, no, <laughs> your sister and I have been managing this bar better than you ever have. 
In fact, I've got questions about where a lot of products used to go. <laughs> you guys will have a better job, or an easier time finding good jobs than your sister and I will. So we're keeping the bar, you guys go find work. And that's exactly what happened. They all became court officers and police officers in the city of Detroit. And the daughter's grandson now runs the bar. So would you consider two women who take over and run their family bar, Rosies? Yes. 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 I'm with you. What about these women? These are the vanillas. I'm a yes on this one, hard. These women were not factory workers. They were the test pilots for the airplanes coming out of Willow Run. They were not given military rank until President Obama in 2008. These women were considered factory employees, even though they were the test pilots for airplanes. For those of you who served in the military, you know that normally you would have an insignia on that front chest. You're part of the bridge builders. You're part of the cannon brigade. And that becomes a big point of honor. I am a Lerubba. I belong to this unit, this battalion, this group. These women were considered factory workers until a run-in with President FDR and Walt Disney and Edsel Ford lead to them being designed, defined as the Fifth Vanillas, uh, a female gremlin from uh, Ron Dahl's book, The Gremlins. They end up getting that insignia, and then in 2008, President Obama retroactively gives them military status. At the time, it's just a handful of these women still living um, who would benefit from that. However, for the families, this gives them medical options. This gives them the choice to bury or reinter their family in military graves. So are we pretty sure on this one, Rosie's? Yes. Very good. There is Finn Finella. Aww. Now the advertisements really start changing. We're in the war. We're in the war deep. The women have been working for years. And all of the rhetoric of, we didn't think a girl could do a man-sized job, has been beaten and proven just the same as the isolationist party was beaten and proven the minute Pearl Harbor was bombed. We have categorical proof we can do this. So the advertisements change. This is my fight too. I'm making bombs and buying bombs. No longer defined as, oh, look how great my girlfriend is. Look how great my wife is. Now it's, I'm doing this. And that first person shift is a huge change. I apologize, I'm going to go back to where my slides got out of order on me. So Norman Rockwell, to his credit, re-envisions Rosie. Several years into the war, he realizes that his initial interpretation of her left out so much of what a Rosie does. Because a Rosie doesn't just rip it. They do any job traditionally taken on by a man. This is called the worker Rosie or the Rockwell version 2 Rosie. She is carrying a hoe. She has a garden uh, watering can. She's got a mop. She's got a telephone operator's headset, an oil can, a pencil tucked behind her ear to take dictation, <laughs> a, a pipe wrench, a dustpan and whisk brush, a lantern, a pair of tailor scissors, a compass, a change dispenser for being a conductor, perhaps, uh, and what looks to be a typewriter on her back. She's also delivering the milk. Looks like a few women you know. <laughs> And this is a great representation of the Rosies of World War II. What do you need done? Pile it on, we got your back. What needs to be handled? We'll do that. Throw it on, we can do that too. I think she's literally wearing three hats in this image. <laughs> this is the other Saturday Evening Post. A lot of stuff focusing on the USO, and a lot of stuff focusing on what will be after the war. That idea of getting to grow old, that idea of family, of Americana, of all the things we're fighting for. So these three categories, USO, Americana, and Rosie, really take the Saturday Evening Post uh, covers for about four and a half years. Any job traditionally taken on, or any job traditionally held by a man taken on by a woman. I want to bring your attention to one in particular. What's on her feet? Saddle shoes. shoes. Saddle shoes were generally considered for children. Pre-World War II, ladies, we wore a heel. Even if it was a small heel, we generally had on a heel. Saddle shoes make a huge comeback in World War II, specifically for women because they're leather, which what they were good for in the factories. They had a good gripping sole, again, good for in the factories, but they were considered a could-do-anything shoe. 
So no matter which job you had, whether it's delivering milk or working on a farm, you could do it in a saddle shoe. And if rationing is on and you're only going to get to buy one pair of shoes, what are you going for? These saddle shoes, I can't speak to what Rockwell's version will produce, but we had a company here in Michigan called the Eastland Company. Anyone familiar? You own Eastland saddle shoes? Very good. Uh, the Eastland Company actually started producing saddle shoes during World War II and earned the Army Navy E for Excellence Award, not for supplying the military, but for supplying the factory workers. One of the very few exceptions to get that Army Navy E. I apologize, my slides got out of order. So, where have we gone in the long span of what we've talked about? We went from minimizing women, saying, we don't think you'll be able to do this, but we're hopeful, to holy crap, look what they can do. To holy crap, look what they can do, and now they've got money, so maybe we can get them to buy some more bonds. <laughs> we have this giant seismic shift in four and a half years. And then victory in Japan, and VE Day, and 86% of women with a factory job in 1945 said they would like to continue working. 95% pink slipped within eight weeks of victory in Europe. Mm -hmm. Rosie, we need you. Rosie, we're done. <laughs> Have you all seen the great film, League of Their Own? Yeah. Totally yeah. other end of the spectrum from uh, <laughs> uh, Jane Frazier's Rosie movie. Um, in that movie, there's a scene where they're talking about closing down women's baseball. And the owner of the league says to the guy who's got managing it, what are we supposed to do? Send the men returning from war back to the kitchens? <laughs> there was this real belief that the men earned the jobs. The jobs were the men. And the women were just filling in. So with the return of the men, the lady should bow, take the curtsy, and get off stage left go back to producing children, go back to the home, uh, home life, and leave work to the men. It was considered unpatriotic for a woman to keep a job that an able-bodied man may need. How remarkable that that was the time. So, how did all of this come to be me writing a Rosie the Riveter book? <clears throat> Cool friends. <laughs> uh, this is the Rosie the Riveter World Record attempt out at uh, Yankee Air Museum, the old Willow Run factory. We had just over 3,000 uh, women dressed as Rosie the Riveter, won the Guinness World Record. Then the Californians beat us, which was great because it was two states bringing a lot of attention to Rosie. So then we won it back, had to go to the <laughs> facility. Where you think, who was there? I know a lot of people. Well done, sisters. Well done. Um, Everyone remembers my husband from this event because he, at the time, was still active in the Army as a drill sergeant, and he came in his drill sergeant uniform, and everyone kept going, God, he's really good at organizing people. away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was phenomenal, and, and it really led to a lot of years of going back and forth to California and Michigan. And what was so great is all of this got wonderful news coverage, brought Rosie up into like the sort of conversation, and then when the pandemic hit, We've sort of, uh, like everything, had to shift and change again. But the rumors are starting, the mumblings are starting, the organization is starting to have this happen once again. And I think our biggest problem is going to be able to find a space to hold us. <laughs> At this event, we had uh, the very youngest Rosie, whose name was actually Rosie. <laughs> and we had a fabulous group. Um, the Tribute Rosies do an amazing job of honoring our living Rosie the Riveters. And we're very often, and rightfully so, we honor our servicemen and women for their contribution to our nation. These women don't get the applause. Don't get the handshakes of standing ovation at a ball game. They don't get invited to throw out the first pitch. And as this was being organized, uh, Allison and, and a large, large group of incredibly smart and dedicated volunteers wanted to make sure they got that moment. What was incredible is as the real Rosies were coming in, some in wheelchairs, some under their own steam, you've never seen 4,000 people go silent the way it went silent. And then a roar of applause that came from our feet up, uh, singing, dancing, and not a dry eye in the house, mind you. But afterwards, we were doing some interviews with some of the original Rosies, and I think shock might have been the biggest feeling. This sort of 
understanding that we were thankful for what they did and we understood how much it mattered. And that continues today with the awesome work uh, with the honor flights and the organization being in the Thanksgiving Day Parade and keeping Rosie part of the zeitgeist of America. There's the required embarrassing photo of me. <laughs> And uh, this ends up with a uh, Rosie Boats. So we're at um, the, the first Rosie world record attempt. And uh, we're looking around, and everyone's sort of excited and talking and wonderful. And the atmosphere was as good as you could expect. It's just lovely. And I'm a professor, and any time I have the chance to teach, I sort of just roll into it. I was talking to a woman in line who had brought a Girl Scout troop. And this troop happened to be from Detroit, where I'm from. And we were talking about schools, and they mentioned their elementary school, and we, we started chit-chatting. And I said, you know, your elementary school was one of the sites where they did the aptitude testing. And we got to talking, and she said, well, if that's true, why aren't there more black rosies? All of my Girl Scouts are black. I'm black and a teacher. Why aren't there more black rosies if it was coming out of our school? And I said, well, there, there were. What do you mean, why weren't there? There, there were. And it became evident that these elementary school kids knew Rosie as the polka dot Rosie, as the J. Howard Miller Rosie, as the Rockwell Rosie, and not as their grandmas and great aunties and, and the people of their community who very much were Rosies. So we started talking about it. We had some time on our hands because we were driving out to Washington. And uh, my friend Nicole LaPointe, a fabulous artist, and she said, well, what if we did a kid's book? And what if we did a kid's book that gave accurate numbers and accurately used images to represent who Rosie the Riveter was by the numbers. To say that 18% of these women were not born in America, to say 12% of them didn't speak English as their first language, could we maybe get people interested? And um, that's how the book was born. We uh, never thought it would become as, as popular and as, as large as it is. It's now a curriculum for fourth grade in the state of Michigan. So we're really proud that some of this is from Michigan. Uh, Nicole's artwork pretty much sells it. Uh, she does these really beautiful collage pieces. But it's been a journey for me of not just understanding who Rosie the Riveter is, but understanding who American women can be. So I will leave you with this, and then we're going to have to do questions. Um, 680,000 women of all ages, of all religions, of almost all ethnicities, some born American, some who had become American, all getting together and taking on one goal that nobody thought they could achieve, and doing it so well that coming up on 80 years later, we honor them as some of the best among us. What would happen if 680,000 of us put all our differences aside and picked one goal again? How much could we affect? Yeah. I went a little over on time. But you're making me nervous with no questions. Yes, sir. Have you ever thought of, although it's not exactly Rosie related, adding the um, contributions of the African American mm -hmm. women who um, were the, the help distribute mail in the European theater? Yes! There's a movie going to, Tyler Perry's making a movie about it. Really? Yeah. Is that in the works now? Yes. I saw oh. a picture of him with women in uniform. Oh, I'm going to look forward to that. Um, thank you, Erica. Yeah. So, you know what my problem is, sir? I want to do everything all the time, and there's only 24 hours in the day. <laughs> that, is, that is my struggle. Um, their book two is done. Uh, it's, it's supposed to come out in February, but they've pushed it a couple of times because of production and printing issues from the pandemic. Uh, book three is going a different direction. Um, we're talking about suffragettes and the suffragism, uh, largely focusing on a specific uh, suffragette named Clara, Clara Amber Burt, and she was a suffragette who ran off and joined the circus in 1880 as a way of promoting the suffragette cause across the country. She learned to be a circus performer so that she could travel across the country for the right to vote in what would eventually become the 19th Amendment. Um, I want to talk about Cannonball Run eventually. I mean, there's so many things that... I, I said the other day, if I won the lottery, not much about my life would change, except I would just be happily locked in a room getting Uber Eats delivered and researching <laughs> and writing. Um, so until that happens, it's on the list, but not coming quickly. Thank you for telling me about the movie. Thank you. Yeah. Where is your Rosie book available? 
Uh, Target has it, Meyer has it, Barnes & Noble has it. Chris, you have it, right? I don't think we have it right now. We'll, we'll oh, solve it. We'll solve it. Um, you can also get it from us and our website. Um, if I can uh, encourage a big favor, shop local. A lot of the local bookstores have it. I also checked East Point and Roseville Library. Both have copies. Uh, but you can get it at Target, Meyer, Barnes & Noble. Yes, ma'am? Where are the teaching? Right now, I'm adjunct, so wherever anyone has a baby, I'm in. I fill up in the class. Uh, I've taught at Wayne State, I've taught at U of M, I've taught at Saginaw Valley. Um, I was supposed to teach at University of Detroit Mercy, but when the pandemic hit, I moved. So right now I'm at U of M, uh, and then I generally take a semester off. Our busy season is uh, the holiday season for us at the tour company. Did you say go blue? I did say go blue. <laughs> National <laughs> champions. Uh, sorry, go for Brad. Gotta, gotta have my moment. One of our favorite, uh, there's 22 of us at the company, and one of the drivers I'm with the most is a big state person. Oh, no. Yeah, her and I are going at it lately. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm adjunct, and the adjunct game, especially post-2000, we, we have to hop around a lot to get work. Um, I'm going to be at Henry Ford Community College next semester. If anyone has a, a student at HFCC in Dearborn, make sure they come take history. Um, we'll be there. But I teach uh, American history pre-World War II. Follow-up question. Sure. Did you see you lecture again? Because you were amazing. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> it was uh, so fast. Well, thank you. I can uh, disappoint you again at your leisure. <laughs> Actually, Detroit History Tours. So we do historical tours of Detroit Hamtramck and Highland Park. Uh, some of you have been with us on tours. Thank you so much. We do bus tours, walking tours. In the summer, we do boat tours. So you can come spend time with me that way. Um, I also do lectures at our facility, the Detroit History Club. You're welcome. If you can't join us in person, we also offer a $5 online sign-in where you can watch virtually and participate. Um, I don't know what we've got coming up in the next couple of weeks. I apologize. I'm in that weird don't have power brain where I don't know if we're in March or February right now. Um, but yeah, we've always got stuff coming up, so you can get us to that at DetroitHistoryClub.com. Uh, I think the next thing I'm doing publicly is I'll be at the main branch of the Dearborn Public Library at some point this month uh, for one of their book club groups. I think it's, I think it's, I'm looking back at my deputy, he's like, I don't think that's on the calendar. I think that's February. Ah, oh, February. Mm -hmm. um, if you jump on here, and, and thank you, that's such a kind compliment. If you'd like to keep up with what we're doing, if you join our email list, we don't send a lot of emails, probably once a month, but we'll tell you the whole calendar for what's coming up. And I highly encourage if you enjoyed me, please be here when Tiffany speaks. She's April. Yeah. She's, yeah, she yeah. Up the I mean, if I had more thumbs, more thumbs up. I mean, if you enjoy me, I think you'll really enjoy her. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just, oh, mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say that uh, there was a um, benefit to the um, um, survive those that su pre succeeded, Rosie, the editor, uh, when I was. Uh, Received my first job right out of high school because my aunt had worked in, uh, as a Rosie at Excel. And she could help get you. Yeah. yeah, well, she didn't, but I told them that she had worked there, and they said, okay. <laughs> could you hear? Um, so the young lady was saying that she benefited from being a generation after the Rosies because when she graduated high school, she was able to get a job through some of those connections. She's a rosebud. She's a rosebud, yes. <laughs> you are? That's, um, rosebuds and rivets. A rosebud is a descendant. A, a female descendant. And a rivet is male a, a male descendant. Oh, I should have figured that out. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Back in the mid 80s, I worked at uh, the Willow Run plant where the B 24 were built in that same area. And in the summertime, I would in install machines. In the summertime, they would open up the big doors. So the whole side of the building would be open. There was a sub ceiling that was all open, and all the original stuff was filled up on the top. And they said within days, they could switch this building back over and continue on. Um, Isn't that incredible? And it, it, was, was, also it was an amazing work. building, just being in there from you know, listening to the history and just having the doors open and just the air that would come in. Just and nice. because it faced east, it would just like yeah, sweep. Just, you didn't smell all that. Henry Ford's old apple orchard. Yeah. There is a, a very cool guy named Kevin Walsh who runs the Yankee Air Museum. 
And uh, years ago, right before the pandemic, he was applying for some grants for repairs on one of the hangar doors. And uh, I was out helping him do some grant writing, and he goes, do you want to open the door? And I was like, okay. Yes, <laughs> and it was sort of like a lift this up, pull this lever, and it was wild because it was just like a big garage door. Yeah. I mean, that, that was what amazed me about it is you think about the hangar door, the Willow Run factory, a bomber an hour, I mean, Hitler's worst nightmare, everything this factory was, and he's like, yeah, just push that button. And it's still smooth as could be, beautifully operating, um, and the suspended archetype ceiling for being yeah, able to move in stuff. Yeah. Uh, the way it was built really, and this gets into a whole other lecture, but really uh, leans towards the idea that we thought the war was going to be much longer than it actually ended up being. We, in, in the early building for the war, largely down to Charlie Swanson and, and Hetzel Ford, they thought the bomber factory would operate for 25 years. They thought this was going to be the war to end all wars and that we were going to be in this for generations. And so they recognized that the equipment and the technology would make rapid progress. Always does during wars. If you could say there's a small silver lining to war, medical advancements and technological advancements all shoot ahead during wars. And so they really built the factory with the idea that by the end of the war, we'd be making a totally different plane, and they wanted to be able to reuse that factory and just mechanize it for different production. Amazingly, and luckily, and terribly, the atomic bomb made the war much shorter than, than anyone believed uh, was possible. And Willow Run for many years survived post-war because it was able to, to retool, um, where a lot of factories like the war and tank arsenal have suffered from not being as modular. Um, although tanks and cars have enough, it's, it's working, if that makes sense. Thank you everyone for coming. I, I was remiss earlier, I have to thank Betty over here for bringing all Yay, the great baked goods.